You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hey everybody, welcome. Sorry this took a little longer than normal. There seem to be some weird technical issues on my computer, but you know, you make it work when you need to. So I will start with... I hope you're having a good day. This episode is going to have even more technical issues because my mixing board didn't work and we had to re-record this on Skype and it was just one of those episodes, man. I think this one in particular is cursed, so bear with us. If you are listening to this, I appreciate it. And of course, I love each and every single one of you. With that in mind, please rate and review us. Give us five stars wherever you are listening because that really helps people find us. And on top of that, if you want to meet me in person... Please, please, please come to see me at Cineprov. I will be performing March 1st, along with um, Evan and Larry as we do Bailout, a David Hasselhoff production. Hope to see you there. Thanks. Bye. I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And we're going to watch every episode of Doctor Who and then talk to you about it. Every episode? Every single one. In order? From an unearthly child to, you know, the future. And we're going to do it in a podcast that we call... The Watchathon of Rassilon. Watchyourrassilon.com. And we're also a part of the ESO Network. So check us out or whatever. Please. Stay Rassle Awesome. Stop trying to make Rassle Awesome a thing. Nope. Welcome to Myopia Mornings. This is a podcast dedicated to revisiting the TV shows we all loved as children and seeing just how well they hold up. This month, we watched the absolutely classic Batman the Animated Series about, well, it's about Batman, the legendary DC Comics super rich superhero brooding in his cave and beating up wacky villains. It's, it's a wonderful show. And uh, to discuss whether it holds up, today we have on our panel a Mr. John Copsey. Say hello to the people. Hello. We have Thomas Herman. Hello, everyone. Mr. Nick Hoffman. I'm still here, guys. Still here. The beautiful, wonderful Aaron Miller. Hi. And I, of course, am your host, Mr. Scott Miller. Now then, Hi. let's 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 jump right in here. Let's get started. Uh, this is the point in the show where we like to do a synopsis to refresh the listener's memories, but of course, this is about Batman. So um, I don't know if it's necessary, but it's a segment we do. So I'm going to make Nick give us an overview. Sure. So <laughs> this is your, um, I believe it's early 90s, like 93. Um, which I realized I should have looked up before I started talking, but fuck it. Yeah, right 92. Here. Started in 92. Hey, ah, nailed it. There you go. All right. Um, and so this is 92. This is WB Afternoons. That's where you probably oh, saw it. If you yes. saw it, which you should have seen it. Um, this is uh, Kevin Conroy as Batman. This is Mark Hamill, um, Luke Skywalker as the Joker. But Woo. what you'll recognize from it is the kind of neo-gothic, super simple animation. It's not short on frames, but it's very stark. It's very... I don't even know how to put it. I, it's it's stunning in many ways. It, this is kind of the uh, highlight of early '90s animation. Thomas, I'm sure you're the one who's trying to cut in. I know you. Oh yeah, no, it, it's simple, but I ass- it is not easy. Like it's it, it is wonderfully beautiful, though. I mean, it, it's an amazingly done show. Well, and, and to to the credit of what is nearly impossible, this show is able to not only kind of redefine Batman, but reestablish all the villains, all the characters in 22-minute segments, invent new ones. Like, this is where Harley Quinn comes from. She's a relatively new character and is immediately embraced by the fandom. And never feel pretentious, never feel over the top. 
I, th- this show in some ways is an animation masterpiece in what animation should do. It's huge in scope, but the art, art carries it in, in an incredible way. Um, so to show it, we like this show so much we thought we should do probably down the line a second episode. So with Scott, I helped chose four episodes all in the first season-ish. This is weird because it's WB, so there's like 75 episodes in the first season, technically. Yeah, this so, is difficult because on Amazon, you've got them into, in volumes. They put them on DVD on volumes. And so it's like, oh, we're watching volume one and volume two, but season one is 70 episodes and season two is 14 <laughs> episodes. So we watched four episodes from the first year and a half of the show, I guess is a way to put it. I don't, I don't know if seasons yeah, is the right way to the, break it up. Exactly. And then as uh, we, we were kind of alluding to, I, I believe, Thomas, you were telling that our mutual friend, uh, Ren, brought up this point that children's shows essentially revolve around the three-year cycle. Yeah. Because that, that's kind of the length of time a child watches a show, Thomas. Yeah, no. So you, it basically is kind of around like the, that specific part of the generation. So if you catch them right at the beginning, by the time it ends, they're moving on to older shows – and the children that are coming up behind them have no interest in watching the shows that their older brother or that older kids were watching. They want their own shows. Um, there's a joy of selfishness to child, childhood, and um, and we uh, and uh, networks pander to that because it makes money. <laughs> but, well, and, uh, and and to wit, this show is essentially three years and then that fourth year no one wants to talk about. So when we return to this, <laughs> we'll probably do third and fourth year. Nope. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick, well, Nick kind of got us started here, and uh, we'll go around the uh, the virtual room here and get everyone's memories of the show uh, as a child. And I, I'll get us started. Um, I definitely watched this. I every time it was on. I'm glad you mentioned WB Afternoons. I'm like, oh yeah, that's that was the block. That that was it. Come home after school. And, and watch Batman. And it wasn't like just me watching Batman. I mean, I know my dad watched it. I know my brother watched it. I mean, this was family sit down and watch Batman, the animated series, which was pretty cool. Um, I mean, this is like when the Tim Burton movies had just come out, the first two. And uh, I mean, Batman was really big at the time. And um, for me, what really carried the most for me was the opening titles um, with that Danny Elfman theme from the movies and the little like like silhouettes of Batman in the shadows beating the hell out of these crooks, the little head swoop out of the way of a punch that he does. Like I I remember that so vividly. And um and, you know, and standing on the rooftop, all iconic for, for whatever Batman does that for. And then and then Mark Hamill as the Joker. I mean for me that's like that's like the greatest thing. And the voice acting across the board is amazing. But, I mean, I will I go around just being like, did you know Mark Hamill played the Joker? Did you realize that's the best Joker that there is? Like, do you want to put him up against Heath Ledger? That's the best one. That's the best one. So that for me, that I've got very vivid memories, and I love this show. Did you know so Mark Hamill was the it. Joker when you were a kid? I don't when know. When you were a kid, did you know I that? don't know. I don't know. Because I definitely did. No. <laughs> Well, Aaron, yeah, go ahead. And what what do you remember about growing up watching the show? So I loved this show. Um, I probably the biggest thing I remember, other than again the opening credits with that iconic music, would be um, I never really I never read Batman comics. I was never like big into superheroes at all. But um, with this show, I remembered every single one of the characters, even into adulthood, like having no other exposure other than this cartoon to the Batman story. Even as an adult, I could tell you who these different characters were specifically because of this cartoon and how I, just how well developed the villains specifically were that they stuck in my mind. Their primary motivation, um, Basically, that every single one of them became a crazy homicidal maniac in some sort of industrial accident. Um, yeah. But but I guess what stuck with me the most is how much it stuck with me, if that makes sense. 
because most Open cartoons desk. from my childhood I remember watching and liking, and I don't really, I didn't carry specific storylines into adulthood into my psyche. Yeah, but absolutely. With this one, I did. Absolutely. I mean, this show takes itself so seriously as opposed to like some other ones. I guess it um, it, it sticks in your mind as an adult later it's not just about toys and things like that which is which is pretty cool um john why don't you uh give us some of your memories i i think like the rest of you i remember watching it after school uh and i was a big fan of the tim burton movies i, I think the uh the the second tim burton movie was one of the first films I can recall seeing in theaters. And I remember being really awestruck by the style, the visual style of it. Mm. And this movie, or sorry, this TV show just kind of picks up where that left off. It's got that gothic kind of look to it. Not so much the, the white face paint and everything stark from uh, Batman Returns, but the art deco, the 1930s, yeah. uh, art style, the, the simple animation that we've referred to. But, uh, like Aaron said, the, the villains were where it stuck out, that it was storytelling, that it wasn't just Batman uh, killing crime or beating crime, like you would find with Superman or X-Men, who were both at the same time. This was as much a story about the villains and storytelling as it was about Batman himself. But, and I think we've mentioned it in some of the other uh, Batman movie myopia episodes that one of Batman as a franchise, his strength is that Batman and the character isn't so much important as the world around him, mm. especially the villains. And in this show, it, it's very obvious uh, as we'll go into it with uh, two, two face and what they did with um, Mr. Freeze in particular. It It's astounding. It's good storytelling and a villain that you either love, you hate, or you love to hate. And just watching it again these past couple of days in, in preparation for this, I was struck again by just how great the art style was. And it still looks good. Even if the animation itself is a little choppy, the, the art style still holds up and it's amazing. But yeah, I still have a, a soft spot for this show from when I watched it, when it originally aired. I, I was a little surprised to see that it was two volumes or three volumes or whatever it was, but it's packed full of episodes, some of which I'm not even sure I remember seeing. And I know I never saw the, the Adventures of Batman and Superman season very much. I think to uh, uh, our, our point that I had grown out of it by that point. Uh, but yeah, it, it, this was fun rewatching this. That's awesome. Uh, Thomas, what about you? Um, Thomas? Oh, good. I'll jump in then. Hello? Oh, wait. There you go. Oh, am I here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I got muted. That was weird. Um, sorry about that. Uh, no, I think I watched this show from the beginning, even though I was probably... I was six when this show came out. Um, but... I I always loved this show, and going back, I still really enjoy it. Um, I agree. The Danny Elfman music from the beginning just you know pulls you right in, and the going back and realizing just how like deep they went into each character, and that they pulled this off and you know in a thirty minute segment is just amazing. And this is what uh, like for Bruce, T you know what allowed Bruce Tim, who was one of the key uh, people behind this. Uh, to really kick off the DC animated universe, which Superman, the the cartoon show being aside, the rest of it was absolutely fantastic going through Justice League and everything else. Um, we got a really great run from, you know, this, this is a beginning. Nick, what about you? Well, listening to the rest of you, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what else to add other than, it's nice to see someone who understands the characters as, I mean, okay, so John, you referenced the fact that Batman Returns is your Batman movie, the one you came in on. I was a little, I'm a little younger than you, but I, that might be the best superhero movie ever made. I, I really love Batman Returns, and I, I, I like both of them. But what it does is 
something origin movies just don't do anymore, which is assume you know anything about the fucking character, man. <laughs> Batman, the animated series, w- hopes that you know the Batman story and then focuses on the origins of the villains. Yeah. I appreciate a show that it gives me a little bit of credit, even as a kid. And guess what? It's still okay if you don't know those origin stories. Batman is this person who fights crime, and then he views the different ways that criminals are created. And some are bleak, man. One of the ones we watched, um, the Mr. Freeze origin story, Heart of Ice, is cr- it is crushing, man. It truly is. Meanwhile, we effectively watched three origin stories, which we'll get to in a minute, of course. But I, I love this show for the little the little things I remember that you know Chris Nolan didn't do as well, that Tim Burton didn't do as well. Because like as Thomas alluded to, this was written by Batman people. But at the same time, it's it's welcoming in a way that like Animaniacs was. It's a show that wants you to watch it and enjoy it, even if you're not a Batman person. Fandoms are notoriously difficult to get into. Um, but mutual friend Scott, mutual friend of Scott and I, rather, uh, Michael Kraus got me this book called Batman Black and White, which is effectively a bunch of cartoon uh, Batman comic writers who um, made Batman shorts, and that uh, he got because of my love of Batman the Animated Series. Those two things showed me what Batman could be, this incredible story um, that really, I, I really fell in love with Batman, and this show is kind of not only part of it, but like the base point. Anyone can watch this show and figure out what Batman is. This is what you show your asshole friend who's a Marvel fan. <laughs> it's about the villains, stupid. Yes. Marvel doesn't get that at all. No. Fuck Ultron. I mean, name one Marvel movie villain. Go. Loki. Oh, yeah, Loki, because he's in seven. Oh, come on. He's not a villain. <laughs> and Red Skull played by Hugo. He's Peter. an anti-hero. He's an anti-hero. Uh, Venom. I can go for a few. Are you talking MCU? <laughs> MCU Venom's coming out this year as an anti-hero, by the way. Oh, Vulture. man. You're missing the obvious one. Magneto. Yeah, there you go. You're missing the obvious MCU. one. I am team Magneto. Magneto okay, so Magneto awesome. rocks. <laughs> Shut me down. <laughs> so you said MCU. That's still Fox, and I know Disney owns Fox. Yeah, now, fair but enough. That has not come the MCU title yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... The villain of all of them is Stan Lee, so. <laughs> That's why he's in all of them. <laughs> right, he's going to be Thanos. Like, <laughs> <laughs> He's just going to murder everyone at the end, right. <laughs> Stan Lee is a watcher. That's really what he is. Like, that was the joke in Guardians. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and they nailed it. They did. <laughs> Well, this is what I like to call getting off track. (laughs) Let's move move things right along here and dive into the episodes that we watched. As mentioned, we watched four episodes. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but we started with the two-face two-parter that had all of the two references you could handle. uh, But also was a very, very well-made episode um this is the well to just a brief summary this is the essentially it's the origin story for two-face it's the fall of district attorney harvey dent and the rise of his angry repressed alter ego uh that that comes out after a freak accident (laughs) that in in, of course uh is it a freak industrial (laughs) accident freak industrial accident that of course only alters uh, half Aaron, of his body. If you're running for mayor. Your platform is just lids on vats. Lids on vats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of what kind of statistics are you throwing out there? Like in Gotham I mean, just, City, just, we have a seventy five percent freak industrial accident rate, <laughs> highest the in the country. The rate of criminals based in chemical baths. Oh my god. Like, <laughs> Nick, you're getting a lids on vats lids on vats like t-shirt for your birthday <laughs> it's just anticipated if it's we coming. ever started a merch 
we ever started a store on on myopia website it would start with the lids on bats uh yard <laughs> sign <laughs> lids on bats gotham 2020 gotham 2020 <laughs> oh well this was a good episode or a two-parter episode <laughs> to get back on track again <laughs> um this this is one of the more serious ones um especially given the other two episodes we watched uh if you saw this one first you're like damn the tone of this show is so dark and serious and there's so much at stake and there's real characters and relationships. And then you watch the other two episodes and it's they they inject a lot more humor. But this one, um, this one's really good. They, they just do a great job, like with techniques and you know uh, the animation. I mean, you know, it's like they're they're in a box with what they can do with the animation, but they make the most of it at every turn to make it really cinematic. It's just a very very lovely episode, I thought so. Sure. Do you want me to give the plot synopsis? Uh, sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I just realized we were talking about it and whatever. So, uh, if you want to get into the detail, go for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, so if you guys didn't know, Harvey Dent, uh, played by everyone at this point, right? Um, but essentially, he's the district attorney. And he is on Jim Gordon's side, he's on Batman's side. And he is frustrated with a very Gotham problem, which is that people slip through the cracks, and that's why they need a Batman. And in many ways, he's got this kind of Batman fetish in his head. Like, he wants to be able to fight crime. He wants to be able to actually stop these people. But unfortunately, he's not going after the Joker or the Penguin. He's going after organized crime boss, right? Like, um... Yeah, and the mafia Warren. has control over judges, so everyone gets off. And and he, as Scott alluded to, has an alternate like ego, like they they reference to like multiple personality disorder. Uh, a guy named Big Bad Harv. This, I mean, because Harvey Dent is this big hulking guy, um, but he is trying to play within the rules. But when the rules stop functioning, he snaps. And Two-Face is interesting because Two-Face still has this sense of justice. It's this bitter truth that justice is based on the flip of a coin. Whether or not someone committed a crime is irrelevant due to sheer chance. And as the district attorney, he thought he could beat it, but he can't. So as the mafia pushes him closer to the edge, we see that break where he turns into pure monster. And scene. Like... <laughs> But isn't that a beautifully deep thing to happen in a children's cartoon? Like, I was watching this and was actually moved by the writing of these two episodes and the and was emotionally invested in Harvey Dent's mental anguish. It's a good episodes, y'all. Good uh, episodes. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, isn't it? That we, we've all got kind of that... that second face to our, our personality. We've all got that suppressed rage that civilized people just don't keep anymore. And Two-Face is the actual embodiment of that. Yeah. and To the, to the nth degree, but yes, very much so. And he does, I think in some ways, especially if you're one of those people who's incensed by injustice, um, there's almost a kind of catharsis in seeing someone, the bad guy who'll go after the bad guys. Um, I, you know, that's why Dexter was a hit show, you know, there's just something appeal appealing about that idea of when the, when the good guys can't get the bad guy because the system is rigged or whatever, the bad but guy can get the bad Batman guy. Is? Isn't he the same as Two-Face? He's outside the law fighting crime. Yeah, I, th I yeah, think but yes. the difference is Batman is supposed to like the thing is they had different limits, and yes. that's why Harvey is interesting, right? Because Batman is what every cop kind of hopes for. Like no cop goes out thinking he's going to shoot the criminal; they think that he's going to get justice, like this teeth gritted justice. And that's why in the intro, it's so interesting. People are just tied up and left in a spotlight, right? And by the way, yeah. Thomas didn't plug this, but you should watch the Brothers Herman video on this. 
Um, I believe your brother David futzed with uh, the intro and did a really good video for YouTube. Oh, but, yes, he did. No, he, he certainly did. It should be linked in the show notes. Yes. I'll <laughs> plug it. I'll, I'll, that's what the Twitters are for. But, um, but Harvey tried the other way. And it didn't work, so now he's going to the other extreme, which is literally burning down illegal gambling venues and just beating the shit out of people, which is great. Right. <laughs> which is great. It is. Batman I mean, goes I, after the justice that lands the bad guys in jail. Two-Face goes after the justice that lands the bad guys in the coffin. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean... I support and, and either like, one. Further, like... Uh, Scott was kind of alluding to, and I guess you were too. He gets the Joker introduction uh, from jo- uh, Batman '89. Like he falls yeah. into the bat. He's like, "Look at these tools. Like this. Uh, this is all I could do. You know, maybe plastic surgery, but oh, oh my!" The mirror. Give me the mirror. Yeah. That is still the most blood curdling scene of any. Yeah, movie. yeah. Well, I do love that they nod to that. I mean, they're not even, and it wasn't as a joke. It was just, hey, this works here. This is also a vat of acid accident. <laughs> this is how this scene always happens. They always have a mirror ready in the hospital. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like the uh, it's like the Bible in the hotel. There's a mirror in every hospital. <laughs> yeah. the mirror. I know you have one. Let well, me see. Well, they know in Gotham they're going to need it because yeah. of the extreme rates of chemical vat accident uh, the chemical vat ward of course that's right <laughs> well, well good news you turned into more of a penguin than a two face <laughs> that's right that's the scale it's yeah. like anything on the scale yeah. of like <laughs> now what happens if another dude has a vat accident that like renders half of his body useless and like mutated like do they tell him I'm sorry you know we already have a two face we're going to have to export you to Metropolis. Or <laughs> we we get this all the time. Binary or two-tone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they have a doctor to push you a little farther down the, the, the road. So yeah. you get three quarter face. Or... Get that Michael Jackson surgery? Oh. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but thank you, Nick. <laughs> Keeping myopia mornings edgy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and timely. Yeah, right. <laughs> Never. We have never been timely. One, one thing that I noticed in this episode, uh, before we move on to the next one, was um, was Rupert Thorne, the crime boss. Uh, I closed my eyes while he was talking because I was like, I know that voice. I know that yeah. voice. And I had to look it up. I couldn't figure it out in time. But I don't know if the rest of you guys noticed this, but the voice was uh, John Vernon, who plays the crusty dean in Animal House. Which I thought was excellent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> An excellent I, I, tidbit. I mean, uh, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. Oh, I was just... And the crusty dean from Animal House delivered, like, the most poignant line in the whole two-parter, I think. Go for it, Scott. Say it. Give oh, yeah. it to us. <laughs> the, the brighter the picture, the darker the negative. <laughs> oh, there it was. I would have loved it if there was a reference to him shutting down like a fraternity just, just <laughs> yeah. somewhere. Like, you know, the show's not above this. Like, they make that kind of reference all the time. Like, it would have been great. He's like, ooh, Chuck how <laughs> Like, <laughs> t- uh, that would have just been a little too much. <laughs> There had to be there have to be a pun or something to get into a Batman episode. Um, oh, good segue. Speaking of puns, but with a second episode that we'll talk about here is the Heart of Ice about uh, Mister Freeze trying to get his vengeance on um, the man who caused the wait for it wait for it free chemical accident that caused him to <laughs> turn into a supervillain. Um, while he was doing research on how to save his wife, who's encased in uh, ice, I believe, of some kind. Um, this, this, episode, this episode was interesting to me because, as Nick mentioned earlier, it does have a very like dark, uh, emotional uh, story at its core, but it's wrapped up in... I don't know, just like, to me, just not not a good package. Uh, there's a lot of corny jokes. It's got a very 
silly ending fight and um i don't know to me this just wasn't as strong an episode i don't know about you guys from what i remember and someone please correct me if i'm wrong this was supposed to be the opening episode for the series Mm. and at some point they decided it was too dark to open it up with so they put man bat instead (laughs) um but this one, I guess it it recreated the um, Mr. Freeze character because he was a lot closer in the comics to the Arnold Schwarzenegger one, just constantly making puns. He's not really a serious kind of villain. He's more for just one-liners. And this one actually gave him a backstory, but they gave him a very depressing, very dark, very emotional backstory that makes you feel more for him than you do for the victims. Yeah. Yes. And yes. But you're right that they still pay lip service to that with the puns like the reporter's name is Summer. The uh, wealthy industrialist is Ferris Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't stop listening to that stuff like thinking this is ridiculous. This is too many puns. For well, they such even, a serious. They yeah. even give him yeah, a, for such a serious story. They even yeah. give him a Schwarzenegger line. I, I mean, you're right. It's probably just paying homage to the comics. But I mean, Batman yells "Freeze," and of course, he responds with, "That's Mister Freeze to you." I'm like, oh god. <laughs> it's jar. I mean, it's a little jarring given the tone of the rest of what they're trying to do. And that's kind of my problem with this one. Do you think that that was meant that for the child audience? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, to lighten it up because it's supposed to be a kid's show? Probably, especially if it's one of the first episodes. Um, you know, they want to draw in the kids, and then later you can have dark stuff like the Two-Face origin. Yeah. But the puns were, they were just too much for me. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is... And the bad guy was brought down by soup. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we. Oh, no, Aaron, Aaron wrote her own pun when this happened. I was like, oh, he's a super villain. <laughs> what? Uh, what kind of a super villain is brought down by soup? A super uh, villain. Oh. That could have made its way into the show. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was operating on the show's level oh, on this What's the matter, chicken? Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> I mean, frankly, to me, the best part of this show is the fact that Batman doesn't want to fight him that episode, right? Like, mm. that he sympathizes with the fact that Two-Face uh, is a victim, mm-hmm. and they don't know what to, like, and he doesn't kind of know what to do about it, right? Like, his, he was, he, essentially, the, the story which they get into, kind of, is that his wife has a chronic illness, and so to save her, she's cryogenically frozen while he tries to find a cure. Uh, right? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's literally all it is. And while she's frozen, uh, the company that he's working for pulls the funding, which threatens her life. Um, and in this, she just fucking dies. Like, yeah. in the Batman movie, uh, the, the fourth one, Batman and Robin with uh, uh, George Clooney, um, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, she still survives even though um, Uma Thurman has effectively killed her. Not in this one. She's just dead. <laughs> I mean, they retcon the crap out of this episode, though. I mean, because you go forward, Mr. Freeze comes back, and I'm pretty sure his wife is still in the I mean, not alive, but still in the vat, like, you know, frozen away. Yeah, I don't think WB was okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, you're, you're right. I remember that. But, like, at the end of this episode, he's not staring at her. He's staring at a figurine dancing like this. And, I mean, it is brutally sad. Like, he he has no interest in crime. He has interest in revenge and saving his wife. Um, and when his wife is taken from him, it's only revenge is left. If Batman gets in the way, he gets in the way. But that's just it. There's nothing fancy here. Um, but the puns really do make it kind of interesting. The, the, the overall story is, is quite tragic because, again, Batman immediately sympathizes. That doesn't make anything else easier, and it doesn't fix the fact that it's a lot of weird puns. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and only to correct slightly, this is five years – or uh, 
this is probably four years before 1997 when that Batman movie came out. So they they were cribbing uh, from something, but maybe cribbing from this, not from the movie, right? Other way around. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about the rest of you, but cold or puns aside, was the the final scene the one that did it for you? If you remember that, he's in um, he's in Arkham. And he's basically speaking to the the ballerina. Yeah. He, yeah. I guess equates to his wife, saying, "I failed you. Yeah. I, I'm so sorry. I yeah. can only hope to meet you someday in the future in some other place." Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. It cuts. Yeah. Well, that's I dark. mean, again, it, it is it's just tragic. It's it, rough it, it stuff. is truly sad. Um, because. It's it's interesting because there's no villainous cons- like constructs here. He's once revenge for a bad person, and he gets it, but that doesn't fix anything, right? Because the guy gets kind of shown as a fraud at the end. Um, the 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 head of the company that owned that you know pulled the funding and was be giving a humanitarian award, if I recall correctly. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that and that last scene was pretty heartbreaking. And I, I really like how we chose these episodes with um, Harvey Dent and then with Mister Freeze as the bad guys because these are two villains that you really sympathize with. They are somewhat the victims of circumstance. And then, but then we ended with the Joker, who is the polar opposite of that. And I found it really fantastic the way that the writers the way that the writers um, differentiated the Joker, who's my favorite, my favorite villain um, for, from the other, from the other bad guys that they've already established. Well, the, the way for me that the Joker, that Mark Hamill's Joker works so well is how he can go from like entertaining, uh, almost likable laughter and joking to just at the, drop of a hat just instantly terrifying like in the same sentence like in the same word he can change his voice where it's just dark and terrifying and he just covers that whole gamut of of villain of just like you know mr freeze for some reason we have a bunch of puns and it's a little lighter even though it's you know wrapped around a very dark story and harvey dent is very dark and then the joker is just kind of all the things he, you know it's it's scary he's violent but then you can have a whole joker episode there he's just a, a goofball um and in this one you, you get all the laughs you get the darkness uh and it, it was just very nice to see the joker he comes <laughs> on screen and we're both like ah yes and that's that's the crazy thing about the the batman uh not just this show but in general is is when you're like happy to see the bad guys. <laughs> um, I love that. I mean, these are just really and 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 what's funny is the Joker is the least established character there is. Well, that's yeah. part of his allure because, like, with yeah. the with the other villains that we were talking, we know what their motivations are. We know how they got to the point that they're at. And with the Joker, one of the things about the the Batman storyline is that the the Joker character has so many different backstories that you actually don't know which one is true. And you don't really know, like the backstory in the killing joke, for example, is very different than from the Tim Burton movie that came out. Um, and it, it's kind of a thing within the Batman universe that you don't really know the Joker's backstory officially. And that makes him more interesting. You don't know his backstory and you don't know what he wants other than chaos. Yeah, that's what well that's what that's the joker I like is he just he is just chaos that exists. He is chaos. And that's all he wants. He's not any he, any feeds off of his rivalry with Batman or not even rivalry, whatever it is. Just his game. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen and he just kind of goes moment to moment and it's great. Like you don't need to know where he comes from or what he's trying to do. No. But honestly, I do think that the animated series is going just a little bit forward. The Joker in the animated series goes darker than, I mean, other than potentially in some of the comics, uh, goes darker than any of the movies ever do with um, with Return of the Joker and Batman Beyond. 
uh, you know, basically taking, you know, brainwashing Robin and like to try and get him to shoot uh, mm-hmm. Batman. I mean, he breaks. Uh, he breaks people. He yeah. breaks people. It's terrifying. You see uh-huh. it in this one. You see the way he treats Harley in this episode. Oh yeah, no. It, Pinching it's, her it's, cheek and then smacking her and throwing her across the room all at the same time, like, he, yeah, that's one of the things that's terrifying. Yeah, we should describe the episode though. Uh, sure. The last one we watched is called the the man who killed Batman. Um, the man who killed Batman is. It's it's a sillier episode. It's it's kind of a comic in in many ways, but effectively this little third rate like mobster who everyone thinks is just cannon fodder accidentally kills Batman. At least that's what he thinks. He ends up fighting with Batman on a rooftop and he falls into an explosion. And the many criminals of Gotham start worshiping him. Slash seeing him as like the the kingpin because he's the one who actually brought down the Batman, and the one who takes it the hardest, most interestingly, is the Joker, who is not only jealous that Batman that this little toady guy killed Batman, but quite possibly um, this is where you get into the does he kind of just love Batman kind yeah. of thing <laughs> where can he exist without Batman? Is there a exactly. Joker without a Batman? Because like. Joker can't exist unless there's a superhero, right? Like that, that, and that's kind of what they're alluding to here. That this yeah. crazy, masochistic, horrifying monster man needs his his cliched, ultra powerful villain type. In like, it just it doesn't work without the dichotomy, and so they have this incredible hatred for this little guy who may or may not have killed the Batman. Mm-hmm. It's a fun episode. I really yeah, enjoyed it. it. It's definitely fun. Um, I mean, I mean, everyone trying to take him down too, because now Sid, the, Sid the Squid's the name of the bumbling criminal, but Sid the Squid's the king of the heap now. Everyone trying to, oh well, if he's the, if he's the big cheese, I mean, it's just um, you're right. It's fun, and uh, uh, but with the Joker, it makes it it just puts it on a whole other level. That funeral right. scene, fake funeral scene or, or whatever, I mean, the Joker, that in that scene alone goes from jovial cracking jokes in the same sentence to just ripping this guy apart and then going, you know, now we're going to stick him in this box down that chute into that vat of acid. <laughs> vat of acid alert. <laughs> Hashtag vat of acid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I do like the idea that bats of acid just kind of cure things to the Joker now. Like, yeah. that, that's something. <laughs> you know, um, and I guess just dofting your cap to the fact that this is the one we watched that had Harley Quinn in it. And as the creation of this show, she's phenomenal as a character. She's really great. Oh, yeah. Harley's awesome. Um, uh, I, don't think, I don't think the show would be the same without her, honestly. Or the DC Universe in general now. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I mean, to your point, the Joker can be darker with her adding comic relief because she she's someone who is a Joker person but not always convinced that what he's doing is not insane. <laughs> um, and so her levity is interesting. The fact that she was a person before the Joker and we know – who she was and that she was a psychiatrist and that like that that part of her is still around kind of is interesting and it shows up in this episode where she's the one who springs him um to the squid from jail as uh i guess pretending to be his attorney um uh, etc like it, it's neat it is kind of neat and she's good at grounding the joker because yeah. he could be just a freewheeling kind of maniac but his re- reactions to what she says and and their whole back and forth it creates a a different character for the joker that Mm. he's a a a little more well-rounded that he's got someone that he kind of sort of cares about but maybe not really but we're not really sure what their relationship really is whether it's really two-sided or just her madly in love with him but she adds a, a new dynamic to who would otherwise be a very flat character Hmm. Agreed. 
Well, this is a good moment to uh, let's start wrapping things up and uh, take. I'm our... sorry, I killed that discussion. No, no, no. 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 We're, we're running up against it. This is perfect. Um... <laughs> and I, actually, I'll just add to this episode. Yeah. This was the one I watched first of, of the ones that we saw, and I was struck in the opening scenes of this the lighting that they had. Yeah, now, it was very, very well put together in terms of just like street lights or car lights or shadows being thrown on walls. It was very well done. Yeah, agreed. That's one thing that we've noticed with myopia with, with some of these cartoons that we've returned to. I've been like, oh my gosh, did they turn out this animation in like three hours in somebody's basement? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> Some truly terrible stuff. But this is, uh, this is masterful and beautiful still. Well, Aaron, why don't, why don't you, uh, Aaron, why don't you kick us off and, and finish, finish your thought and go over um, how this uh, held up for you, some of your final thoughts? Well, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a series that the, the storylines actually stuck with me into adulthood. And I remember speaking with Scott even at some point within the past year and saying, hey, do you remember that Batman thing that that we watched as a kid? I'd really like to watch that again. So I actually revisited this on my own time as as an adult recently, and I watched every single episode. I really think there's some strong stuff here, specifically with the storytelling, um, both in the writing and in the presentation. I would highly recommend, um, I'd highly recommend a rewatch. Absolutely. Um, John, what about you? Yeah, this, this held up very well. And I went on to, and watched a few other episodes that I remember, and some of them held up pretty well, and some of them did not. Um, but it is just a well put together. It's a well thought out uh, series, and the animation. I mean, l- like I just said, the lighting is good on some of the episodes. It's fantastic, but then some of the animation itself is is lacking. Like it's very jarring. It's very blocky. It's like sometimes they skipped it a little bit you know, on the budget. But overall, it's it's the stories that do it, and it. You've got good character development. You've got uh, excellent plots. And we didn't mention it in the discussion of uh, the Mr. Freeze episode, but that, that episode won an Emmy for best writing. And it was just fantastic. And we're still talking about it. And this, I think, is still kind of the gold standard for animated comic book shows. Um, I vaguely recall uh, the X-Men TV show trying to take a more serious tone I think because this show did and you know I, I will never forgive Superman for trying to latch on to this uh, <laughs> in his third season but yeah, yeah, like, here. It, it's still really good Nick yeah I here's the thing about this show I think you guys nailed it it's, it's, it's excellent it's pretty to look at the characters are good it's amazing how good it is at being controlled in the the kind of show and don't tell or vice versa, not both. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of scenes where it's just Batman looking. There's a lot of tension built from the fact that we don't know exactly what's going on, but it's okay. You forgive flat characters and you forget simplicity because it's doing so much with so little, and it's really quite impressive. Um, not unlike Aaron, but a little bit further in the past, I had rewatched a bunch of this. And so Scott has been pitching a TV version of this, of myopia, for a long time. And you just kind of knew that this is something we had to do. It's almost hard to nail it down. Um, and so very flippantly, I, I picked a handful of episodes um, from a list uh, that I remembered and, you know, we, 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 we chose them intentionally. But it's just one of those things where we could have picked anything. Even a shitty episode from the first two seasons is still kind of a masterpiece in some ways in just simple storytelling. There's not a lot of exposition. There's not a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of – in like well done storytelling purely through visuals. And for that, I think you should check it out. 
Thomas. Uh, I'm, I mean, I don't have a ton to add from all of that. I can I can respond to John's point about kind of sometimes where the animation's a little jarring, where it's not hitting the mark. Uh, one of the problems around this time period, and Disney kicked this off, is uh, that we would outsource animation to different production houses in Korea, Japan, France. I mean, wherever we could get it done the cheapest to try and bring down the price just because making cartoon shows is very expensive. And so if you can get the anime, you can send off what you need, but get it to a good art house. You should be able to get a good product back. But sometimes the controls don't work as well as you want them to. And that's some of those episodes, especially for a season for Batman that really, really clash with the standard that we, we came to know and love. Sure. Uh, but uh, some of the, I mean, this show is amazingly paced. And one of the things I researched, cause we talked about timeline is that, I mean, shows got an extra, I guess, what, three and a half minutes or so back in the early 90s than they do now for total commercial time. And it's, I guess, you know, that along with how just well this was paced and the cinematography really just let them tell a complete story, even in the limited time frame they had per episode. Because they didn't do a ton of two-parters. I mean, Two-Face, yes, but typically not, you know, not very often. And this show just managed to nail down character. I mean, it was just a character study through and through. And um, I think that's really why it still holds up because it, it's just amazingly uh, well acted, well, well drawn and just well put together. And, and I didn't do this to anyone else, but I hate Thomas. So um, <laughs> if you look at the Batman logo, you can see that where occasionally the colors invert. And I know that notice that, especially in the, uh, uh, the Heart of Ice episode, where like it would turn from uh, black on yellow to yellow on black because of because of like you were alluding to, like the the, the cheap animation where they didn't have the right uh, Korean uh, animation studio yet, as the Simpsons joke always was. So exactly, yeah. Yeah. nice catch. Yeah. Um, well, uh, for me, yeah, this is. I mean, you guys hit all the different parts. I mean, this is a wonderfully produced show in all ways. And, you know, any limitations they might have run into with animation or the motion of it, they worked around it. You know, having Batman fight in silhouette or just utilizing the art direction and uh, the music, the voices, the characters. Um, it's just all really iconic. Um, I've been playing... Uh, Arkham Knight on PlayStation and the whole Arkham Trilogy. It's Mark Hamill as Joker and it's the original voices for Batman and Harley and and it's it's just wonderful to revisit that in another way. Um, and it just made me really nostalgic for this show. So it's kind of perfect timing for me and I'm really glad we watched it this month. Good uh, female characters too, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, I, I know we're at the end and I shouldn't be throwing another thing in there, but good female characters. I liked the female representation. The women were important to the plot. And, I just, and not, that's that something that sense. like today is really in the media and in the headlines about how few good female parts there are and, and things like that. And this being, I mean, early nineties, what was that? 20 years ago. It's being a 20 year old cartoon show. The, the women played important parts in this series and i appreciated mm -hmm. that well absolutely and if i remember right one of the best episodes was when harley quinn and poison ivy team up yeah yeah yep. and great it was fantastic yeah yeah i remember that episode and i loved that episode because they're both sick of being taken advantage of and taken for granted so they decide exactly. to go off and do a girls club thing yep yeah god i love i love this show <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it. That's a, that's a good way to end this one, guys. Um, that'll do it for us on this month's Myopia Mornings. Be sure to subscribe to Myopia Defend Your Childhood wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episodes. We'll be back next month with another attempt to ruin your precious Saturday morning memories as we go on one hell of a magical field trip. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. I'm going to have that song stuck in my head for, you know, the next few hours, right? Just from that little plug right there.
Myopia Mornings is a member of the ESO Network and produced by Dude Letter Podcasting. It is hosted by Scott Miller and co-hosted by Nick Hoffman and Aaron Greer. It is edited by Nick Hoffman and Candace Burns. The theme song is Buddy by Ben Sounds, and the music is available on bensounds.com. Please rate and review Myopia Defender Childhood on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Tune in next week when we put another piece of your past on trial. Thanks. Thanks.